Um, Brian Drews Diaz. Um, I live with an American name, and I am a Paraguayan citizen, but I live in America, but I am an American. So, that's complicated. Do you want to talk about this, John? <laughs> okay, cool. I don't know. You know. Grew up here. Went to school here. Motivated by the American dream, I guess. I don't know. I mean, to, to us, what it was, I guess, is, is, is being comfortable enough to maybe make our own dreams come true. Whether that be, like, for my parents' uh, small business or for me, like, being anything I wanted to be, you know? A writer, a priest. I moved here in 1989. Yeah. I started first grade here. I was seven years old. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I've always gone to Paraguay back and forth. So I think that's why, that's why, uh, meshed with my identity a little bit more. The fact that I was still being exposed to a lot of, uh, a lot of Paraguayan culture at the same time, as well as American culture, but of course school and what is expected from someone who's from another country. And mainly that being from my parents is what motivated that. Motivated my my personality, I think. I feel like the concept of being an American has aged me more than the concept of living. And I feel like that has a lot to do with the societal expectations of what it means to be in a country that is greater than another. And... And, and that puts into conflict, you know, am I Paraguayan? Am I, am I American? When I go back to Paraguay, they see me as an American. I'm, I'm the American. I don't, I don't speak as well in Spanish, but I, I obviously can, you know, talk. But um, here it's like, it's not so much seen unless they have provoked it or they have identify that in me. So that that's where it becomes like a little bit weird, I guess. I think I'm I'm an American further you know, first and foremost, I am an American. And so that's that's where the preoccupation comes from, from from an administration where you don't actually know what they are saying because they are refuting so much. There are people with green cards, there are people, permanent legal people being denied of their, of their rights as being legally residents. What wouldn't happen to me is that someone would profile me as a terrorist affiliated legal resident because there are legal residents right now being profiled for possibly being affiliated with terrorist organizations where, you know, that's such a vague category. That's such a vague understanding of what actually an identity is beyond your struggle for being in this country alone. Someone had told me, you're not from here. I think the the biggest factors that make you from here are not only within time spent, but also with the culture and the, the knowledge or the even privileges that you get for being affiliated legally with this country. And uh, that has always been a struggle, the same as those who, who came through Ellis Island and through, in the early times, the first immigrants to come to the to the United States, they were also seen, no matter what, as provocations of the American way, which was already in itself a revolution. A struggle with the war that not all of, it, not all of us are fighting, but we feel like are fighting because of our sovereignty. And the sovereignty, the, the, the identification that we have with the national identity, blah, 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 that is what makes it so hard for us to actually 
fold into each other as more than just Americans, Paraguayans, Haitians, Africans, Middle Eastern, Israeli, Jewish. But at the same time, there are people that value their religion more than nationality. Whereas there are Latinos right now being less valued for their sovereign identity. Whether whether it's Mexican, whether it's Guatemalan, they don't see beyond the national identity of their being in refuge in a country that is fortunate enough to be as rich as America is, other than they're just trying to take advantage. Whereas if there were Jewish refugees or, I don't know, a European ancestral ancestry, then that would be a different discourse, I feel. Because I I am also not as much in fear as a lot of people because I am of European ancestral immigrants. I'm not from Mexico. I'm not from Syria. I'm not from Guatemala. I'm not from Honduras. I'm not from Colombia. I'm from Paraguay. And yeah, that should be recognized through and through. Well, there are the powerful people and then there are the citizens or the people who are trying to make change. I mean, I don't know. Uh, who are not of great power that are trying to change the way we think about our own status as citizens of the world even more importantly because of societal policy or rule or standard uh, citizens of this nation of my family well, I mean there were just some 20-year-old kids who fell in love and then they were going to college at the same time. They realized they weren't really connected with the college, uh, you know, with the, what they were studying because there's really only four things you can study as most countries outside of the United States. reason why we came here. They decided, you know what, we're going to be in love. And then that sort of sparked a move to the United States of America because they felt that with that they will have more of a decision. Um, the the segue to making that ab- available to at least people who would inherit their legacy of moving to the United States of America uh, was to to get any job possible here. And that was, of course, first and foremost, to live, to work for people who needed their assistance on a daily basis who were wealthy. Um, So therefore my mom became a housekeeper. My dad is a chauffeur, cook, landscape. He did everything. And they always sort of found ways to work with uh, wealthy people of every in New York. I feel like my parents were very dedicated to their job because they thought that the necessity for money would only come from being closer to it. I guess they understood a level of the level between getting that success and how much money they were working with or under does affect like their generation, their their oncoming generation, which was to have kids and to have people who were grown up here and prosper. That, that was the understanding for them, is that the people who felt like they were stuck in a certain place in their own nation can come to the United States or to Europe just as well, as many of my relatives have done. And work whatever jobs they 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 got stay as close to wealth as possible and build a foundation for the people who came after them who were their sons their grandsons so on and so forth 
So there's a lot of economic and social intertwined in that story, in, in everyone's story. That's very similar to mine. And that's not any more special, any less special, because the fact is that the empathy is within what we don't have, what we don't give each other, which is that just that acceptance to be welcomed. There is a certain gratefulness that comes from that move, from the move from your home to somewhere where it's like literally a casino of a country. You know, I mean, you're taking a bet, you're taking a risk, you're moving away from what you know, you're moving away from your culture. And the results can be plentiful. And then there's the immediacy of those jobs, actually. There's the immediacy of having your wife, bringing her, doing that adventure, and saying, I work at this wealthy building, I'm a doorman, I'm a housekeeper, I'm a chauffeur. But this is where it starts, you know? And, and in a lot of this, again, I have a certain belief that it has a lot to do with our own ancestral backgrounds, a lot to do with race, a lot to do with a hegemonic tendency towards it, race. It's, it, it's just like, I think where we progress most because it's most unfelt and most psychologically deep is how we're controlled by the people with most acquisition of the wealth of this world. And it's just, and, 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 and wealth is real and wealth should be respected, but it should be equated to, to more even terms, whatever that may be. You have a lot of countries right now and many people are unaware of the, the marketing packs or the trade groups within Latin America and North America. It's very divided, you know? Paraguay has always been allies with, with the United States of America because they have a lot of land, first of all. They have a lot of aquifers, second of all. But, but it's this deeper pact where it's like, from Paraguay's perspective, it's more like this is where we want to be, and that's that's concerning to me as well because that's beyond sovereignty. That's like a a, a market strategy that you use as people's collective identity, and if you don't have that collective identity so easily as you have money, then that's that's where I think problems lay. And I don't know if you want to call that socialist or you want to call that utilitarian. I feel it's something that needs to be approached differently. Humans are sensitive. And with her left hand, she's pointing, Mary, Mary, macho, macho, to America, to America. And I'm looking at that sight, as long as I live, I'll never forget. We arrived in New York on a beautiful 